My name is Harold Adams, and I live in Los Angeles, California. Thanks, Harold. Harold, how did it happen that you entered the human services field as a career? Well, it's a long uh, kind of winding path to this, to what I ultimately ended up getting into. Uh, early part of my life, I was wanted to be a professional musician. I got an undergraduate degree in music. I uh, made a decision after I graduated from college, however, to, uh, to change my pursuit for music because my interest got very narrow. It just concert company for singers, and I did some professional work, but I felt like I could not make a living at that, partly because I got married and had a child. So I decided uh, to switch to academia. Uh, I had my undergraduate degree at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, and I moved my family to California and went and got my master's and doctorate at UCLA in um, political science with a major in African studies. Um, while there, I just kind of um, decided that academia was a little too confining for me. Uh, I was fairly successful at it. I published it as a graduate student, which is quite an achievement. However, I thought that I wanted to pursue something that involved me more in, in actual life rather than academia. What year was this, Harold? This was back in 19... I went to UCLA from 1963 to 1967. And so I... So after, after getting my degree, I decided to pursue other avenues. Uh, I had two options at one point, and it just points out how uh, accidental life can be. Uh, you really can't predict it. I was a finalist for the Nielsen rating uh, establishment of a regional center in Los Angeles, and uh, so I, I was one of the two finalists for that. I, in fact, went back to New York for an interview. My, my uh, competitor was a fellow who had been in, involved in radio marketing. So in the final analysis, they decided to pick a guy with marketing background rather than someone with a research background. So he got that job. And so what I ended up doing was uh, being the first uh, African-American to enter the county CAO system, CAO system by exam. That was in 1967. So that started my career in public service. Uh, I went from that to, for a brief time, I worked for Lockheed California Company as a public affairs representative, working in the community. Uh, eventually left that and went to run the a nonprofit corporation established in uh, South Central Los Angeles called Economic Resources Corporation. Can you say that again, Lord? I'm sorry. I, I, after leaving Lockheed, I took the job as the executive director of the Los Angeles, I mean the Economic Resources Corporation, which was a uh, economic development administration program establishing job creation and economic development for South Central Los Angeles. Was that a private nonprofit? It was a private nonprofit organization, yes, with a private board. I was a director there for a couple of years, and I left there and became the assistant city manager for the city of Compton, where I stayed several years. Wow, what year was that? Oh, 1971, I believe. Um, I was there when Compton started to change politically. Uh, when I first went there, it was a, kind of an exciting job to have because Compton was one of those all-American cities with a great mix of economic and racial classes. Yeah. But then along came the Watts, Watts riots, and there was a lot of white and middle-class black flight, and a lot of uh, movement of lower-class uh, lower blacks and Latinos into Compton. And it, the politics changed. It, it kind of reflected that. It became quite an uh, unpleasant place to work, so I left. And initially, I went back to Washington, D.C. as an assist, executive assistant to Assistant Secretary of HUD during the four years. I stayed there for a while, but I missed Los Angeles and I missed my kids. So I came back here and started working for the city of Los Angeles. Pardon me, Harold. Um, you work in HUD, and what specifically? Which housing? Uh, the, uh, equal opportunity. I was the I was the executive assistant for the assistant secretary of HUD. Yeah. There are a number of special assistants, but one exec, and I was her, uh, uh, Dr. Glory E. A. Toot. Oh. Uh, I worked for her as her exec for a uh, for a while until I decided I needed to come back to L. A. Great. Proof Okay, there yeah. we go. Carol. Please continue. Okay, so when I came back to Los Angeles, I initially was hired into the mayor's office to run the Model Cities program. 
Who was the mayor then? Uh, Tom Bradley. Uh, I'd had prior experience in Compton as part of the Model Cities program. And so I, my job initially was in the mayor's office, uh, and I had the uh, an, an enviable um, situation of trying having to close down the Model Cities program because it was switching to the Community Development Black Grant program. So uh, that was a rather trying time. But part why, why was it trying? Well, because you know politically, the idea of trying to close down a program that involves citizen participation and a network of community organizations that have been accustomed for a number of years of receiving monies in their oh, community. Oh, contract. Right, and uh, there was a particular councilman at the time, a, a, a councilman by the name of Bob Farrell, F-A-R-R-E-L-L, -L, who strongly believed in community participation. And, and, and all of his spleen was directed at me because I was a person charged with the responsibility of closing, closing the, pro the program down. I remember one specific example in which uh, uh, during the budget season, he uh, made a motion to write me out of the city budget. <laughs> and he got a second, and it passed. <laughs> that uh, must have been awful. It was awful. It was, uh, you know, and I, I, I wondered, why would all these people like Joel Wax and, and uh, John Ferraro would support it? And an alleged friend of mine, Dave Cunningham, seconded the motion. But uh, So I went around and asked everybody, and, and they had no particular reason for doing it. They just thought... Bob needed this. They didn't have. They knew nothing about me. In fact, Ferraro confused me with someone else who had been the previous director of Model Cities, who had actually ran against Bob Farrell. So I mean, it was resolved because Council Gilbert Lindsay, bless his soul, uh, uh, introduced a motion to to reverse it. So that was kind of a trying time. What year was that? Nineteen. Uh, gosh, when was that? That must have been somewhere around 1974, 75. And the Model Cities program at that time had incorporated what kinds of things? It was a it was a, uh, a block. It was it was a program that concentrated uh, federal resources and other resources into specific neighborhoods. Like in the case of the City of Los Angeles, there were two neighborhoods. There was the Greater Watts neighborhood and the Greater East Northeast neighborhood, two Model City areas. Mm -hmm. And there was an annual grant from HUD, which was uh, used to help. Uh, 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 improve those two communities through the social services program, economic development program, and housing programming. And so that's uh, that's what the Model Cities program was all about. So that was phasing out, yes. and the community services block grant was coming in. Well, it's community development block. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah, when they combine all of housing and social services together in the grant we have even today, and the uh, the fifteen percent that's in this current law. For social services and the community development black grant program came from the historical model cities program which was basically a social services program were the funding amounts roughly comparable when they began to phase in the community no of course development it, block grant? you know this is the it usually happens when they combine programs in this case they combine the model cities programs the neighborhood facilities program sewer grant programs into one black grant program during the nixon years the amount of money for each of those programs combined became less. <laughs> Usually, the way government works. Yep. Did you then go ahead and start implementing the community services, a uh, community development block grant? Uh, well, actually, what happened after they closed the program down? One of the positive results of the Model Cities program is that each uh, municipality that had the program had something called a public. Uh, Improvement program, not public improvement. What we call public employment program, PEP, yeah. and that so we became our model cities program became the community development agency of the city of Los Angeles. So we was all civil service. Same thing happened with the CETA uh, grant, became a, a city department, and as a result, of that, I became the first African American general manager of the city of Los Angeles in its history in 1976. Well, that was a real yeah. honor. Who was your uh, staff at that time? Um, city employees or contract well, employees? Well, when we, when we became a city department, the city administration agency in 1976, all the employees who had come into the Model Cities program through the community were folded into the uh, city civil service system. Really? Without by, competition? Without competition through a charter event. That was a requirement that the federal government put on the city. So all the people who are now, well, many of the, Many of them have retired, like myself, but 
the early days of the community development department, the housing, primarily the community development department, and the job training program for all community residents or young professionals who had gone to graduate school and had worked in the community before they came into city services. So that was a relatively smooth transition. Of, a relatively smooth, yes. Cities to in fact, it was very smooth for such a large city. Very smooth. Well, when you um, started implementing the Community Development Block Grant, what were the major thrusts that the city was interested in with that programming? Um, well, I think initially um, there was kind of a bureaucratic war going on between the various factors to try to dominate the grant in their favor. I've, of course, I've been coming from a social services background at that point primarily, I was interested in trying to maintain the size of the, the old model cities program right. under the community development department. Uh, there was a new thrust into affordable housing uh, through the mayor's office. Um, and a lady who subsequently became the, the, the state controller, Kathleen Connell, came on the staff and kind of led the movement for uh, the uh, housing department, I mean for, for housing, affordable housing. and. Um, we all got into one big city department called the Community Development Department at the time. And his first general manager was a, was a fellow by the name of Jerome Miller, who came out of a labor background, labor training background. I was one of the assistant city managers, and his assistant, a fellow by the name of Steve Porter, became the other assistant city manager. So it was a, Jerry Miller was the initial uh, initial general manager. Steve and I were the two assistant general managers, and I handled the part dealing with housing and. Uh, social services, so Kathleen was the head of housing beneath me, and and uh, Parker Anderson worked in those early days in social services programs, along with a number of people you may know. Yes. Harold, um, can you explain a little bit the complexities of trying to develop programs under the city governmental structure? Well, in the case of the city of Los Angeles... Outsiders have always right. thought it was difficult. Well, I like to compare the ease the relative ease of the county of Los Angeles with that of the city of Los Angeles. This, the county of Los Angeles, you know, just, just in an overview, I don't want to get into great detail, the, the, st the, stream of, the stream of power is more direct and clear-cut from the supervisors down to the operating departments. In the case of the city of Los Angeles, however, you have 15 council people who really run the city, uh, but you work for a mayor who is the executive, but then does not have as much power as the individual supervisors. They work through a committee system. Another uh, and those councilmen in the city are all full-time uh, uh, politicians with their own staff. So in order to get anything done, you have to go through staff, individual council people, through committees, to the through full fifteen offices. Often. Oh. And then to the full council. And then, hopefully, the mayor goes along with it. So it's a it's a much more um, uh, Byzantine structure. You also have two bureaucracies that that compete, similar to what you have in the federal government. I mean, the federal government. You know, you have the GAO and the Office of Congressional Budget. Yes. In the city, you have the CAO, Chief Administrative Office, which that works with the mayor. Then you have the um, I'm going to block on the name the right legislative now. Legislative and analyst office with the council. So it's a much more complicated process and involves the, the, the bureaucracies and executives of the various city departments to spend a great deal of time in, in a kind of a non administrative function, yeah. meeting with council people, etc. You must have had to develop very uh, sensitive political antenna to maneuver there. Well, uh, you, uh, if you were successful, you had to be, or you had to be extremely uh, um, combative. I, I tended to be of the latter nature, which sometimes worked to my disadvantage. Uh, I, I learned over the years to be a little bit more diplomatic. I often clashed with um, uh, the offices. But in the long run, it, it didn't work to my disadvantage. Uh, I mean, I was not unreasonable in my approach, but uh, this just kind of two approaches yeah. to follow that system. You either cave in. No, you don't need. To. If you cave in, you lose. They lose respect for you. And a lot of a lot of executives make that mistake in this system. We're just always doing what the politician wants, and you end up 
you know, what have you done for me lately yeah. mentality. You have to either learn how to maneuver your way in a diplomatic way or you have to bull ahead, you know, and I tend to be a mixture of those two approaches. Did you did the uh, city council people in the city change frequently, um, and did you have to constantly keep re-educating people about your program? Well, in the early days, you did because they didn't have term limits. But uh, when, when uh, Richard Reardon, and I O R D A N, became the mayor, <laughs> uh, he came in on a kind of a, a populist approach to government, uh, the charter, and also the ter term limits, etc. Then you start getting change over. Fortunately, I missed most of that because I retired in the early days of uh, the, the Reardon administration. When did you retire? I retired from the city, I believe, in 1996. Yeah, but when I retired, uh, part of the reason I retired is because uh, the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority was going through some, somewhat of a crisis, and there was some discussion about, at least from the city's perspective, I don't know about the county, of the dropping out of it. And I had some friends in the mayor's office uh, who wanted me to kind of to consider going over to see if I could, from the city's perspective, uh, help salvage the agency. And so that I was—I wanted to retire because my wife had already retired, and uh, and I was interested in this as something to do, for, for like the last chapter in my public service career. So I I retired and went to the Los Angeles Public Services Authority as this second executive director. Carol, could you? back up just a sure. little and tell us from your perspective, because you were still in housing, what factors led the county and city to create the Los Angeles Homeless Authority to begin with? How did it come into being? Well, you know, I'm not sure because I would, that, at the point that that occurred, I was not directly involved in it, but I know that there had been a, historically a series of lawsuits going on between the city and the county about this burgeoning problem of homelessness in the county and whose responsibility with it was. Uh, the city claims that the county's responsibility because they had the welfare role to play. The county was you know, countered with the fact that most of the homeless people are in the city of Los Angeles since it's a much larger city in the city and in the county, so it was kind of their responsibility. It was those kind of arguments going back and forth. And there was a, a lawsuit, I believe, and then a, the part of the settlement was to create this joint powers authority called the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. And who were the parties in the joint powers? Well, it was the, the board, county board of supervisors and the city council, the uh, mayor and city council of the city of Los Angeles. And as a result, the, the governing board of this joint powers authority called the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority consisted of five representatives appointed by the five uh, county board of supervisors and five representatives appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the city council. Well, I was somewhat familiar with the uh, formation of Lhasa, and yeah, more than I'm <laughs> sure that you wouldn't want to say this, but at the time you came in, you were a very welcome change. The agency was indeed in a state of crisis, and many people were concerned about what was going to happen with what had been a very arduous lead. And created entity and everybody had a lot of hope for it. Can you tell us what it was like when you started there and what steps you took to bring the order to it that you did bring? Well, you know, the when I got there, they were, I mean, to be quite candid, they were very, very, uh, uh, the staff was not very, uh, not very competent. Um, there were very few systems. The first director uh, was a, uh, an advocate, a very sincere man, who believed strongly and was very knowledgeable about the homeless issue. I wasn't particularly because I was, uh, I'd never been involved in homelessness at the street level. Mm -hmm. I was you know, always involved from a bureaucratic level. So he had a clear vision, mission of what it should be. I uh, gather he just liked certain administrative abilities to pick good staff and uh, things like that. So it was, it was, it was somewhat in the shambles, I, I would say. And so my, my uh, first, uh, uh, emphasis was to hire appropriate staff, which involved uh, having to let a lot of people go. It's something that's always difficult. You know, yeah. I never liked firing people, but uh, it was something I had to do in that situation. Uh, and I had the support of everybody doing it. And uh, so the first thing was just to set up systems. Um, uh, so that's what I, my primary emphasis was in the very beginning, was just to get staff and stabilize the organization and, and, and try to develop some credibility um, for the agency. I had a, I had an easy job of doing that in the city because everybody knows me in the city. 
and uh, there were all the politicians at the time, and I was supported by the mayor's office. Uh, the county was a little different because I had been involved in the county. Uh, I knew I knew uh, a couple of councils. Well, I knew Zev Yaroslavsky because he had previously been a city councilman. And you knew Gloria Molina, I'm sure. Uh, not too well. Actually, actually, when I knew uh, better was probably Yvonne Brathwaite Burke because I had oh, met her in my yes. earlier days when I was in Compton. So, uh, but and I also had some contacts to her office from members of the uh, Lhasa board. So, uh, so the combination of establ establishing a a working staff, functioning staff, and trying to turn around the issue of credibility for the agency. That was my first, my first involvement. I think all people would say that you were quite successful in that. What, when you retired from that agency, it was when? 19... Uh, either 1999 or early part of 2000. I really quite can't remember at this point. It's a, I guess it's a function of... I think it was... It's a function of age. You know, you forget these kind of things. But they're not really important. Yes. Well, um, everybody felt that you had done a successful yeah. turnaround with the agency. Um, what was your perspective as you left on where it was headed with the issues of homelessness here in Los Angeles? Well, um, when I left, I was um, I was somewhat pessimistic because despite the protestations of all the apologies about the importance of the issue, when I, when I by the time I retired, there was very little follow-up to these words. Uh, they, they spoke highly of homelessness, but they weren't, they weren't willing to put their money where their mouth was. They were quite candid. And, um, the county and the city. The county and the city. And they were still struggling and fighting over who should do what and how much money should go from this and how much, you know, all, all the, all oh, the yeah. usual issues between bureaucracies. And um, there was a change that occurred sometime in the last couple of years. Uh, first of all, uh, Jan Perry, the council person for the downtown area of the city, where most of the homelessness, or well, a large part of the homelessness is located, became an advocate for it. And she pushed it. She put money where her mouth was. She got the, the, the mayor, the new mayor, James Hahn, H-A-H-N, involved. Now, from the county uh, side, I'm not sure, but I think it was a combination of Zev Yaroslavsky and um, uh, Yvonne Burke that also got on the bandwagon, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not sure about it, I believe, because I wasn't there at that point, I just, from what I've read in the paper, and I've heard talking to people about it. So, all of a sudden, Lhasa as an agency started growing. Uh, when I was there, with a very small budget, and I was quite proud of the fact that I was able to run it on such a small administrative staff, and uh, something that made the rear very happy, of course. But now, it's an uh, agency with a lot of staff, it's more than doubled, uh, it's, uh, a lot more money from the county, a lot more money from the city, and... I think it benefited from the stability and the credibility mm -hmm. you brought to the agency. I know from the county's perspective they weren't frightened anymore that the money would just melt away. Right. I think also the, the selection of uh, the new director of Mitchell Netburn uh, also helped. Uh, he had a long history of involvement in homelessness since he had been the deputy director of the homeless agency in New York City, yes. a much larger agency than Lhasa. So I, you know, uh, I think he was just a man for the times. Uh, so his personality was quite different than mine. He's not, he's not an aggressive, abrasive person like I can be. Mitchell is the type of guy who is kind of mellow, but very smart and very competent man. And uh, so I think a combination of change in personality, a change in times, uh, a developing interest in homelessness that occurred in recent years by money being put into the issue. I think uh, I, I feel much more positive about it right now. Although I recently had conversations with members of the staff and the money's not growing uh, commensurate with the problem. So they still have financial problems. Uh, uh, no, for example, this year the Super NOFA, which is the Notice of Funding Availability that they do annually, they only have $2 million for new projects. Oh, so, because <laughs> all the other money is, is eaten up by renewing projects. And so next year, they may not even have any money for two projects. And they may be facing cutting in the existing programming, unless new money coming from some source. 
Well, it's going to be interesting to see what the governor and the federal budget do to housing. Right. Because they're shifting a lot of social services money around. Right. Well, in addition to the homeless problem, Harold, how do you feel that the city and county have done in making progress on the whole issue of affordable public housing? Uh, again, just my experience is primarily in the city. I can't speak too much of the, of the, about the county, but I, I think that the picture is fairly optimistic and positive with respect to the city. The city has a, 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 a whole new list of council people because of term limitations. Most of them tend to be uh, more liberal. Uh, one of the main issues is affordable housing. Uh, the, the new mayor, James Hart, is also into affordable housing. There's been a recent upgrading of the status of the Affordable Housing Commission, all of which leads to uh, uh, much more emphasis being placed on affordable housing. Uh, so I, I, the picture looks very good from the city's perspective. There's money being set aside as a priority for support of affordable housing. I mean, it's, it's a political reality. I mean, there's a city that has a, a, a growing population of people who can't afford the, the historical rents in the city of Los Angeles. Plus, there's just not enough uh, of housing to, particularly housing that for larger families. I mean, historically, Los Angeles has been a, a city of apartments of one and two bedrooms. There's a growing population of uh, these for three or four bedrooms. So, um, there's an effort to try to match the population mix and the housing mix in the city of Los Angeles through uh, help from the government. And I think it's very positive. Well, um, in your career, you've done many different things, but they all have a common, all your jobs had a common theme of working within communities to try, try to develop something better for the people who live there. What would you say was the most exciting and gratifying program or time that you ever worked in? I think the most was my early days in the community development department because it was a new department set up after the demise of the Model Cities program, and, and it had, the community development department had the social services money, it had the affordable housing money, uh, uh, home rehab monies, it had the labor department monies, it had aging monies, you know, aging money. so they're all in one department. And so, but it was a new department, and I played an instrumental role in a number of things happening. I played an instrumental role in establishing the field offices for the uh, uh, private family rehab program. Uh, I also established the first criteria and guidelines for the social services pr uh, program, which uh, carried out even today in the community development department. So, uh, so that's the time where I, I think I was in my creative best. It was because I was involved in establishing systems that are still in existence in the housing department in the city of Los Angeles, in the community development department in the city of Los Angeles. I was kind of the lead. Exciting. Yeah, I was kind of the lead person in all those things at the time. Do you feel that your PhD helped you in these jobs? Uh, yes, because it was political science, and of course, within government, being somewhat aware of um, the workings of government and, and all that, mm -hmm. I think they played, a, uh, played an important part. Yes, I, I think you would have been better than being a, a doctorate in some unrelated field, yeah. like medicine or something, yes. <laughs> um, what was the most difficult or frustrating or negative time during your career in terms of the programming and the social events that were going on? Oh, that's difficult. There were so many. I, I still think probably the most stressful for me that pe the period of time when I was, that I alluded to earlier, when I was, well, I didn't allude to, I talked about earlier about uh, closing down the Model Cities program. Yeah. I was an extremely unpopular task. Yeah. And, uh, and it had all kind of political ramifications. But I learned a very valuable lesson from that experience. That you know, in the type of job and you're very familiar with this yourself, given the work mm -hmm. you've done, that when you're working with the community, you're always in conflict with politicians. Yes. Okay, and you have to. So it's a very stressful work, and you have to learn to distinguish between the politicians attacking you in public, in the public arena of the, of the council, on an issue, or attacking you personally. You know, in most cases, uh, you just have to have a strong ego because they're not attacking you because they don't like you. They're attacking you because you're espousing policies that interfere with what they want to do. So it's not a personal thing. So you have to you have to to learn that, or you don't get crazy. And and I, during that period, I learned that. 
I, I was able to distinguish between personal dislike and you know a programmatic uh, dis uh, disagreement. You know, so so I learned a lot from that period of time. Another very uh, well, that's you asked me about things that make yeah. create a problem. For me. Well, that's probably the biggest. I think also I, I felt a little let down and disappointed in the latter part of the years in Compton because I was so excited about Compton as a as a model city and as a place where you know things could work well because of all the things I described earlier, the mixture of races and classes, and beautiful tree lined streets and, and one of the top junior colleges in this in this in the country. It just all fizzled away. It, was it horrible. seems to have had constant oh. and chronic problems in the last fifteen years. Oh, yes, it's just twenty years. Down. And part of it had to do with the, the, the population shift, but a lot of it had to do, unfortunately, with the downgrading the quality of the political leadership too. Yes, there's certainly been a share of yeah. uh, conflicts and, uh, well, <laughs> everything you can imagine has gone wrong there. Harold, um, if you were to go back into full-time work now in the human services field, where would you want to be? Oh, that's an interesting question. I haven't even thought about that <laughs> since I don't plan on doing that. I enjoy my life as it is now. Uh, what would I want to do? Um, I probably would want to go back into uh, affordable housing because I think that's uh, an area where, in the case of the city of Los Angeles, it's not doing very well right now. It has the, it has the political interests, it has the money, but the bureaucracy that runs it has uh, dissipated. My my wife used to be the director of housing for the city of Los Angeles, and she helps establish the whole systems for um, their major grants program, you know, the funding of large apartment buildings. But most of her staff, because of uh, constraints of money, were on contract. And all the people that work with her now are scattered all over the private institutions of the city. You know, the, 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 the person in the various banks who are involved in affordable housing from a, a, a private perspective were no longer there. So I'd like to get back involved in, uh, in affordable housing in the city of Los Angeles if I decided to do something like that because I think there's a great need for um, experience and, and there are real problems right now from my perspective in the city of Los Angeles at the staff level. It's certainly a challenge for the people who live in Los Angeles. We have such enormously high housing costs right? and <clears throat> our wage base is falling, which is difficult. Right now, Harold, I'd like to stop for just a moment and resume as I turn this tape over. Thank you. This is side two of the tape recording, oral history of Harold Adams. Harold? Well, you've certainly had a long and varied and really very successful career. Now that you've retired, what are you doing in your personal life? Well, uh, since retirement, uh, my wife and I have spent, uh, have done, continued some uh, professional work. We have a consulting firm, uh, a, a local uh, limited liability company. We do some consulting. Uh, we have a couple of uh, small contracts with uh, helping agencies get funding. We also got involved in a couple of um, uh, large affordable housing projects as a co-developer, which have uh, finally all reached fruition, with the exception of one. Uh, but most of my time is spent now in the pursuit of things that have always been my interest, uh, the arts. Um, I'm on the, uh, I'm the, the new president of the Center for the Arts in Eagle Rock, which is a, a growing organization that we have a very dynamic uh, director, and we're growing by well, using bounds, so I'm really excited about that. I, um, I spend a lot of time now in, in music, musical events. I, I sing in the, in, and conduct right now the, the Men's Glee Club at the, Ap the Downtown LA Athletics Club. I sing in a, in a chorale out of Occidental College, which is uh, quite good. Uh, so music, which has always been my passion, and, and the thing I still think I know the most about, although I haven't pursued it in any type of professional since I was in my early 20s, I've always been retaining an interest in it. Uh, so I do that, and in addition to that, my wife and I do a lot of traveling. Um, we spend part of the year in the south of France. My wife is French, 
and we, 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 we to our second place in France, we bought an old 300 year old stone farmhouse which we're renovating and modernizing, which is, keeps us quite busy. Um, and then we travel to other places. Uh, we spend the summer in France, and then sometimes during the early winter we used to go someplace else. Like last year we went to Vietnam and Burma, and this year we're going to go to uh, India again. Uh, so I spend my time with music uh, and with um, traveling. So that's basically what my life involves now. That's a rich kind of life. Harold, you mentioned that you had children. Yes, I have, I have two children. And my wife, who's my second wife, also has two children. And together we have five grandchildren. Does that keep you a little oh, busy, yeah, too? Well, I, I, sorry, I, I forgot to mention that, uh, obviously. What are their names? Well, my son, who is a forest ranger and lives up near Kern, um, up near the Kern, in Kern River, the Sequoia National Forest area up near Kernville, has two children, a daughter, uh, age 11, named Haley, and a son, uh, Sammy, age 7. Uh, my wife's oldest daughter, Maureen, has a, a son named Dimitri, who's 11. And uh, her youngest daughter, Pascaline, has two children, Mila, five years old, and a little boy, Hayden, who's two and a half. So, you know, I have access, unfortunately, uh, to only three of them because my son is up in, uh, up, in, uh, up in the middle part of the state, and I don't see him that much since he hates L.A. He just won't come here. So he comes at Christmas time. So we see him at Christmas time, and then once or twice a year we go up to see him. So, uh, But I have complete and total access to the other three grandchildren, which I spend a lot of time with. That sounds wonderful. Well, Harold, if you were to address a group of aspiring young college graduates, would you recommend that they consider a career in human service in Los Angeles or California now? Um, yes, I would, you know, I think that it's, a, it's certainly a worthwhile endeavor to be involved in government work. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't limit it necessarily to social services work. I think that um, government service is very important, it's often maligned in our country, it's, you know, it's wasteful and unnecessary. But people don't realize that somebody has to pave those streets, somebody has to keep those parks open, somebody keeps those libraries open. Uh, people don't realize how important government service, government life, government is to their life. So I think it's a very uh, uh, commendable and worthwhile endeavor, and I would strongly support people uh, uh, deciding to use pu do public service as a career. Sounds like you felt positively about your own career. Yeah. Then. Carol, as we close this interview, is there anything else you'd like to add or any other thoughts or um, anecdotes you'd like to add to your oral history? God, let me see what can I think of that might be of value. Can you turn it off for a minute? Let me think about it. I thought I was going to talk about music. But, uh, um, in terms of things that probably have affected my life more than anything else, I... Um, I think you have to know a little bit about my background. Um, I'm the first person in my family, in history of my whole family, that ever went to college. Uh, I was born in rural Georgia back in 1937. So for the first 10 years of my life, I grew up as a rural black person in, in the race south, and I, so I know what that's all about. I learned an awful lot about that. I moved north with my family, first of all, to Cleveland, Ohio. And in Cleveland, I had an experience which probably had the greatest impact, one, one of the two greatest impacts on my, my future life. Um, my family was very poor, and uh, we lived on the east side of Cleveland, which, like most east sides, is a poor side. <laughs> and uh, I remember we stayed in one little room up over a bar owned by a distant cousin who was the numbers banker <laughs> for, the Cleveland, for the city of Cleveland, Ohio. Name was John Chin Ballard, and uh, a numbers banker. Uh, well, a numbers banker is a, is, is the mob. You know, it's the numbers racket. You know, the business. Oh, it's like gambling. Gambling. Oh yeah. It's, yeah. It's a it's like gambling. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, cousin John was the black numbers banker. Okay. I mean, he was uh, pretty high up in the, in the system yeah. uh, for the city of Los Angeles. His wife took a liking to me, and because we were having trouble financially, uh, I ended up spending a number of years number of my formative years living in what they call the Gold Coast of Cleveland, which is where all the, the 
you know, the doctors of the profession black lives along the lake, along East Boulevard. I mean, I had my own room, I had a maid, I was in fashion shows, I hobnobbed with all the hoi polloi, um, I, uh, I, I, I spent an evening with Paul Robeson because the next door neighbor is the, with the most uh, renowned medical family in, in Cleveland. So I, he had Paul Robeson over, I spent an evening with Paul Robeson, my playmates were Teddy Horn's son, I'm not, not Lena Horn's son, Teddy, and, uh, and the next door neighbor who was the adopted son of Dr. Lambright Jr., his name was Donald, who was the son of his wife, uh, Dr. Lambright's new wife, and Stephen Fetchett. Oh. Uh, now, Donald, Donald, Donald with birth was in Walter Winchell's column, so that's, that's the, I, I had breakfast with Duke Ellington, and I knew Joe Lewis, Ray Roberts, all these great people. What I, a culture change from coming precisely. from more background in the South. And I, and I went to an integrated junior high school, uh, elementary school in, in Cleveland. Uh, so, I mean, I had a very enriched, uh, I thought, when, uh, when I, now I took piano lessons when I was in Georgia because my father always wanted me to be a musician. It started when I was four years old, but it was relatives, you know. It's, but I, when I moved to East Boulevard, I, I had the, the piano teacher, the wife of the concertmaster of the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra. So I, I read it entirely. So I lived there for a number of years, but eventually I had to move back with my family and the part of town. But it had a, a great impact upon us, me as a, in terms of the positive effect it had upon me as a person. Also, it tended to, and this could be viewed either positive or negatively, but it tended to direct my life in kind of a, as a, a marginal existence. In fact, I was never neither black nor white, but I had both. And so I don't, I, although I'm, I have a strong identity as a black person, I don't live my life in a black world. I don't live my life in a white world either. I just kind of live my life in with people. In a multicultural environment. And so I think that was very, very important to my development of who I am now. A second experience I had, I think it also added to that, is uh, when I was at Wayne State University, I was the assistant conductor, the, uh, the uh, assistant pianist of the uh, Glee Club, and I sang bass, and we were on the, a, a tour of Europe. I was on the first tour group that went to Europe. So I, when I was 20 years old, I had a chance to experience being a black person in Europe. And, uh, and I, it was really, a really eye opening for me in terms of broadening my perspective. I think that I ran a, I had At that time, Europe was uh, much more welcoming to blacks, wasn't it? Oh, Not than our country. Well, I, I don't know if you ever read the, uh, Nobody Knows My Name by James Baldwin. He talks about how people, the Europeans, react to him. I, mean, I felt that I'd be walking down the street and people would come up to me and invite me to dinner. Uh, I remember once sitting in the Harper House with my back to the dance floor. We were we were chug -a beer, you know, a bunch of college guys. And this, the, every time this couple would dance by, or dance by, the woman would rub my head. I mean, it was, it, it was just oh my it was, it, curiosity. A curiosity, but curiosity. It, but it, but it wasn't, it wasn't friendly curiosity. But it wasn't offensive. It didn't yeah. strike me as being offensive. So I finally said, to "Das ist gut, ja, she said, ja, das ist gut." <laughs> uh, so I had all this kind uh -huh. of experiences uh, outside of of the U.S. as a black person, and it, it, it all added to me as a person. So um, uh, it gave me a, you know, a, a universal view of things. Uh, mm -hmm. So I had a lot of life experiences which I think uh, have been positive in terms of my development as a person. That's probably now. why you were able to move so comfortably into a very difficult political arena mm -hmm. with confidence well, as you well, did. Yeah, I, another thing that I think adds this confidence is when I, my father always has been a musician himself. I mean, he's an insurance salesman, but he always had a quartet. My father always would leave with his guitar and a quartet. And from about the age of 12 on, I used to play for them, the piano for them. And uh, we had a radio show in Detroit, Michigan, where I, when I was 15 years old, I was playing on the Sunday program with my father's group. Della Reese also, we used to sing with Della Reese a lot because she was, back when she was... The Della Reese? Yeah, before she, wow. was big, before, she was, before she was a big star. And one experience I remember is, uh, I think this was in Cleveland, we used to always do Sunday morning shows out of funeral homes. And there's a big uh, uh, African-American funeral home in, in, the, in Detroit, it was. Diggs Funeral Home. Matter of fact, the son was a congressman that went to Charles Diggs. And I remember sitting at the piano, I was about 15 or so, uh, in an open casket next to me with a body in it. <laughs> so my father pushed me at an early age to, to get out and perform, and so I, you know, I 
I'm, I'm seldom at a loss in a situation where I'm thrust into something. I can usually, you know, have self-confidence to fumble my way through it. And it's usually fumbling, but I fumble my way through it. Those so are anyway, very wonderful stories about yeah. your growing up. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. So anyway. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.